starting in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I, would lay to, I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. The word of the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, and you are a God of truth. In you there is no falsehood, there is no lies. You are a God who is holy, holy, holy. You are a God of grace and mercy. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Father, we confess that we are duplicitous. On the outside, we appear one way, and on the inside, we are very different. We hide our faults. We hide our motivations. We hide our struggles, our fears. Father, we confess that we have chased after the wind. And we, have, we continue to struggle in the vanity of this world. And Father, we confess that you are our only hope in life and death. It is you alone who has quenched our souls with the living water. You are the bread that has satisfied our palate. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us life. We thank you for the revelation of your word that you have not left us in darkness, but you have shined the light of the truth. You have called us to yourself, and you have sent us to go and tell all the world the good news of great joy, which is for all people. Father, this morning we come to you and we pray that we would lay aside the distractions of this week, of this coming week, the struggles, the fears, the worries, the anticipation, the shame, the guilt, and that we can drink deep of your grace, your amazing grace that saves a wretch like us. We once were lost, but now we're fine. Found, we're blind, but now we see. Father, feed us with your word, the bread that comes down from heaven. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that burn for your glory. In the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, if you're not already there. We'll be looking at the last few verses of John 13. We remember that we continue in the upper room discourse, and Jesus has just sent out Judas into the night, into the dark of night. He has told them, the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him that this glory that the Christ is returning to is a glory that is through the road that leads to the cross. That all who come to the cross may find and come into the presence of the Father, the glory of the Father. But then he says, in the meantime, while I am not with you, the sign that you are my disciples is that you love one another. And this is not just acts of duty and compulsion, but it's acts of self-sacrifice. That self-sacrifice, the standard, which is the cross, where Jesus laid down his life for his friends. The shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. And we are called to lay down our lives self-sacrificially when it's not convenient, when it's painful, when it's difficult. We are called to love our brothers and sisters, and the world will know that we belong to Jesus by how we love one another. But immediately, as we see this morning, Peter interjects. He's like, I'd like to go back to that whole you're leaving us thing. Because you have to remember, we have the omniscience of the narrator as he is writing after the fact. 
And when we read through John, we're like, isn't it obvious that the glory of Jesus is the glory of the cross? But the disciples had no clue. The disciples are still thinking something else is going to happen. And difficulties are going to arrive. And there are things that will happen. But this is where the influence of Satan working in the sin that's in our hearts makes the disciples say, I would never do that. I would never do that. Maybe some of you have thought that yourself. When you look at other people and you see their weaknesses and things that they do, silly things and stupid things and reckless things and, and things that people don't understand, and you say, I would never do that. Peter probably said that same thing. And the, that comes from a heart of self-reliance. Rather than trusting in Christ and trusting in his work on the cross, we trust in ourselves. And often we have a much higher view of ourselves than reality is. We tend to see the warts and the flaws and the pimples and everybody else, but we gloss right over those things in ourselves. We hate the pride that's in everybody else, but it's the one sin that we can't detect in ourselves. And that's often reflected, I can't believe they did that. How could somebody do that? I would never do that. Famous last words, right? Maybe some of you have said that. I know I have and had to repent of that. Often when we rely on ourselves and we, our pride fuels ourselves, we miss the glory of the cross. The self-sacrifice of the cross, because that's what makes the cross glorious, is because Christ laid down his life for his friends. But in our own pride, when we say, I would never do that, we puff up ourselves above our friends and push down our friends. This morning, as we see just three quick verses that are almost a transition till we get to 14, we learn and we see a picture of ourselves. We see the danger of self-reliance. And the danger of faith that is built on self-reliance. And we see our need to trust Christ and put our faith in Christ, not in ourselves. So this morning we will see three ways the glory of God is seen. First, in verse 36, the glory of Christ that is promised. Then we see the glory of Christ that is denied. And then we will see at the end of John the glory of Christ that is restored. Notice verse 36 as we see the promise of the glory of Christ. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward." See, Jesus, in verse 33, tells his, his uh, disciples before the upper room discourse, he says, I am leaving you. I'm going. But I only have a few more hours in my life on this side to be able to give you what you need. And so he says, where I am going, you cannot come. And then Peter probably the mouthpiece for the rest of the disciples, pipes in, in his typical fast, bombastic fashion, Lord, where are you going? He doesn't understand the significance of Jesus' words. We do. We recognize that only in a few short hours Jesus is to be arrested, but Peter has no idea. Peter has no idea it's even Judas, because Judas has just slipped out. Jesus says, go do what you're supposed to do. And they think he's running errands. In reality, he's betraying the Son of God. So Peter's like, now where are you going? And it's more of uh, not a question of what is your destination. It's, it's a question of what about us? What about me? Why are you leaving us? Peter's question reveals a deep concern for his own welfare and his own well-being. This is not what he expected. See, the disciples all had a different understanding of what Jesus would be doing. They come in with expectations. Some of them believed Jesus was supposed to be a political revolutionary who would come in and conquer the Romans and let Israel set up their sovereign state, and they couldn't be any more happy about it. 
that some of them believed he was the Messiah, the one that, that in Luke 24 says, the one to redeem Israel. And the best part about this was the Messiah was coming and we were his 12 best men and we will have a place of honor in the kingdom. Who is the greatest among us? That's why when their Messiah began to wash their feet, it didn't jive well with their expectations. Something was wrong. So as Jesus says, I am leaving, they come with a great shock to Peter. And they come to the disciples who, who their selfish ambitions and their misguided expectations and their blind ignorance obscured their view of the panoramic of salvation. They completely missed the purpose that Jesus came to lay down his life for his sheep. So they had completely separate expectations. And Jesus answers the question of, Lord, where you're going, this. Where I am going, you cannot follow me now. But you will follow me afterward. See, Jesus has compassion on his disciples. He doesn't say, you big dummy. Will you just be quiet and I'll explain everything to you? He has compassion, something often we don't have for people that are weak. And people that just don't understand. We are short and uh, full of temper. He doesn't ridicule them. He doesn't chide them. I've been with you. I've taught you for three years and you still don't get it. Nincompoop. It's a very spiritual term. Yes, I know. My children are going to say it and I'm going to get a letter now. Um, Jesus reassures them that their fears do not thwart the purposes of God. And specifically the separation that the disciples naturally want Jesus with them. And if Jesus is leaving, what about us? Where are we going? And he assures them, we will be reunited. Where I am going, you cannot follow. We know that Jesus is going to glory. But we also know that the, the glory is not the where the, the way to glory is not the way the disciples expect. Because the road to glory passes through Calvary. Golgotha, where criminals were executed naked, dishonored, and shame outside the city. This was not a place of glory. But Jesus is going there to lay down his life for his sheep, that his sheep may have eternal life. Jesus doing this, what he can only do is opening up a new and living way to the disciples. And ultimately we see, that's not what I was, I changed it along the way, so that's not it. Ultimately Hebrews tells us, therefore brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. And he said, this is a new and living way that he opened uh, for us through the curtain that is his flesh. Jesus is going to do something that only he can do. Opening up a way to glory of the Father, the glory that he experienced before he came to earth, the glory he is returning to, but he is actually taking the road of suffering and dishonor and dis the, the disgrace. However, that path that Jesus walks will one day lead his followers also to glory. Jesus will shoulder the weight that only he can bear. Jesus will sacrifice his life that others may have eternal life in the glory of the Father. But he must walk that road to glory alone. Yet in the midst of their fears, he assures them and he gives them a promise. You will follow afterward. Now immediately the, the, the disciples know that he is going to glory, and, but it's, John has a double meaning here. It's not just simply, well, God is bringing us to glory, but we ourselves, to be able to go to glory, must walk the way of the cross. And the way of the cross will ultimately bring you reuniting with Jesus. Their, their, their separation is not a permanent one. It's not a tragic twist of fate, but it is according to the plan of redemption, according to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in perfect unity, accomplishing redemption to bring His people to glory. 
Because Jesus was faithful to endure the cross and bear the weight of sin, the way to the glory of the Father was open for all. Christ would leave them to go to glory, and his work on the cross would enable them to follow him. The disciples needed to trust his promises and trust the faithfulness of Christ, even when it didn't feel good. Even when it didn't feel right that Jesus is leaving, I don't want you to go, Peter was saying. What about us? Sometimes, I remember Robert telling a quote that he would say before he even got sick. He said, sometimes the salvation of God feels yucky. Yes, that's another deep theological word. Sometimes the salvation of Christ feels yucky. Sometimes it feels like tearing away of something or someone we love. But one day we will look back and see that it was, in fact, a saving grace. The difficulty and the pain that the disciples were feeling, the expectations, they were actually according to the plan of grace. And the disciples are like, what do you mean you're leaving us? What about us? This doesn't feel right. I don't want to be left behind. But the disciples needed to trust Christ and trust his promises because his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. Nothing was more evident of that when Christ walked the lonely road to the cross because the disciples said, this is not right. Go read Luke 24. The disciples said, we thought he was the one and they were crushed. It, the sovereign hand of redemption didn't feel good. It felt Yucky. We fall in the trap all too often that we, Ocean Park, say the same thing as the disciples. What are you doing, God? What what about me? Where have you gone? We doubt the wisdom of God and we don't trust his promises. We want God to meet our expectations and to accomplish our desired outcomes. And if Jesus doesn't do what we expect him to do or what we want him to do, we forget his promises and we fall into despair. We doubt and we grow disillusionment. Calvin talked about this in one of his commentaries. He says, we hear daily from the mouth of Christ in the Word. All that is fitted for usefulness in life and all that is necessary to be known. And when we come to practice, when we have to put these things into practice, we are as much astonished as apprentices who have never heard a word ever spoken. And in other words, we have been given the gift of God's word that we read and we study and we remember. And that we have the promise that God has equipped us for every situation we face, every challenge that that arises. Yet when the rubber meets the road, what happens? We act as if we've never read a word of God's word. I remember my first, I worked at AT AT&T for about 12 years. Customer service on the phone. And there was a long, extensive training, about 12 weeks. Eight of those weeks, you would read the manual and you'd have role playing and and the teacher would ask you questions and we would listen to other incumbent reps until I remember the day I went down for the first time to take calls. Malcolm Burke was sitting next to me and it's seasoned rep and I remember getting the first call and you would at AT AT&T you'd hear a beep and your greeting would play and then the customer would talk. And I remember it was this, this old persnickety man calling about a postcard about a 411 charge. Eight weeks of training went out the window and I stared at the screen like a deer in headlights. All I could muster up was hold please. You probably, you know, you probably have felt that way. And Malcolm looked at me and says, dude, really? How often do we do that very same thing with God's word? When things go, go as we expect, the way we want them to go, We act like we've never heard it before. We've never heard the promises of God. We've never heard, the Lord has never worked in our lives. We forget the way he has provided for us. And we are like a deer in headlights. And we worry and we doubt. 
and we question whether God really cares. See, just like the disciples, if we build our faith on the promises of Christ, it will never fail. But if we trust ourselves, and we trust our self-confidence, and we trust our expectations and our wisdom, it will fail us every time. And if you're taking notes, you can write that down and take that. That's money in the bank right there. We see this example as this glory that's promised in verse 36. I will go and you will come after me. But then we see Peter, the glory denied in verses 37 and verse 38. Notice Peter, uh, it's, he wasn't ready. Peter wasn't ready and where he needed to be, even after three years of following Jesus and seeing the miracles and eating the bread and sitting in the boat and sinking and then Jesus pulling back. He wasn't ready. He didn't get it. He's like us. Amen? Amen. Peter trusted in his passion. He trusted in his strength. He trusted in his wisdom. Peter could do nothing to save himself, but he was trying to do everything to save himself. His pride would lead him to a devastating fall by God's grace. Notice verse 37. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. All the disciples were like, ooh, oh, look at that. <laughs> Probably not. They were like, oh, geez, here he goes again. <laughs> See, rather than trusting in the promise of Jesus, Peter was trusting in his own self-confidence. He trusted his perspective, his understanding, his desires, rather than the perfect wisdom and the unobstructed view of the panoramic of redemption that Jesus had before the foundations of time. He demanded for an answer why he couldn't follow Jesus now. Why would you not let me fight to the death, Jesus? Why would you not let me bear the sword for your kingdom? See, Peter was ready and willing to fight to the end because he thought he was exempt from the weaknesses and the limitations that plagued others. I would never do that. He thought his strength was mightier, his wisdom deeper, and his devotion was stronger. Therefore, he could accomplish great things for Jesus. Jesus, you really got a good asset when you, when you called me. You, you know, that Bartholomew guy, not so much. Me, you struck it rich. That was a good, good draft pick. Peter could not follow Jesus now because Peter was fighting the wrong battle. He was fighting for his glory, not the glory of the cross. Notice Jesus' answer in verse 38. Will you lay down your life for me? Jesus knows. Jesus knows what's going to happen in less than 12 hours. Peter's going to run away like a little girl from a couple servant girls and some people around a fire. Truly, truly, Jesus' grace looks deep into Peter's soul and says this, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. And I can imagine the cold chill went down Peter's neck and he was speechless. Now, Peter, Jesus does not deny that Peter will not lay down his life for him. But notice what he says. He says, he attacks Peter's self-confidence. He says, your self-confidence is going to fail you, and it's going to fail you fast. The same pride that would just in a few hours lead him to rashly attack the high priest's servant would ultimately, that pride would fuel him to vehemently deny the fact that he knew Jesus. The only thing Peter's self-confidence would get him was a lot of bitterness and a bloody ear. Nothing worse than a bloody ear. See, but that was the grace of God. The grace of God to allow him to taste the bitterness and the futility of his self-confidence. Because had he not, he would have still plummeted over the edge of eternity, trusting in what he could do for Jesus, not trusting what Jesus had done for him at the glory of the cross. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. It's on page 833 of your pew Bible. Matthew writes the account of Peter, what would unfold in a few hours. Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through 75, through the end of the chapter. 
Now, Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. Jesus is inside. He's on trial. And, and Peter's just a few hundred yards away from where Jesus is being brought before the, the, the local authorities. And notice a servant girl, probably 12, 13, if that. A servant girl comes up to him and says, you were also with Jesus the Galilean. But Peter denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. It wasn't the authorities who had the power to execute Peter along with Jesus that he denied him to. It wasn't the religious leaders who could make his life really difficult. It was to a little girl, little junior high girl, behind a fire, who had no power, no authority whatsoever in life, that Jesus was denied by Peter. Peter's self-confidence fell flat. Then it continues, and, and it says in verse 71, and when he went over to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, these people standing around the fire, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. He sounded like a Galilean. They were little redneck Jews. Very country. and it's lit, Seriously, they were country. And they were country Jews. And when he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know the man, immediately the grace of God called out through the voice of a rooster. And Peter remembered the sayings of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And notice what, G, what Peter's self-confidence got him. He went out and he wept bitterly. Only by tasting the bitter failure of self-confidence could Peter be led to surrender to the sweetness of grace. Only by tasting the bitter failure of self-confidence could Peter be led to surrender to the sweetness of grace. Peter had to die to himself and his self-conscience or self-confidence before he could follow Christ. He had to realize that his self-confidence and the folly of his self-confidence before he could realize the glory of the cross that Jesus walked alone and endured for him. Only when his strength failed miserably before a bunch of nobodies would he find the strength of Christ that would sustain him in times of difficulty and in times of lack. For faith built on self-confidence will always disappoint you. But faith built on the promises of Christ will never fail you. Faith built on self-confidence will always fail you, but faith built on the promises of Christ will never fail you. Ocean Park, let me ask you this morning, how are you living according to your fickle power of self-confidence? Think about it. Some of you are like Paul Simon, without the musical ability. I am a rock. I am an island. A rock feels no pain and an island never cries. You are deliberately leaving people, and Jesus for that matter, at arm's length. You refuse to open your life up to other people because you are so consumed with yourself. You have your needs, you have your wants, and you have your desires, and you have little time for anybody else. Because friendship causes pain, and it's laughter, and it's nothing or something else that I disdain. I am a rock. You have self-confidence. Your faith is just a bunch of tidbits of facts and verses that are really a reflection of your smug self-confidence. Ocean Park, is your passion for Christ more a reflection of your personality and your effort, or is it a reflection of faith in Christ and His promises? Some of you are the vote for Jesus type. Okay? People who use Jesus to accomplish their ambition and their agenda. We excuse egregious sin and moral failure if our political candidate says what we like to hear. 
We will rubber stamp any political party and platforms as long as they pay service to what we want to hear and how we want people to vote. We deem one party or one candidate an agent of the Lord's hand and the other one is an instrument of Satan if they do what we want them to. And it's interesting during the elections how one side says they're Satan, the other side says they're Satan. One said they're the instrument of the Lord and the other one is. And then about a month or two later, silence. Because what you want to do is you want to put your faith and your self-confidence and you want to trademark it with Jesus. Sometimes our self-confidence is allegiance not to Christ's kingdom, but to the fleeting political party of the kingdoms of this world. Let me ask you this morning, is your passion for Christ nothing more than your political agenda wrapped in the garment of Jesus? Or is it built on the faith of Jesus, or the promises of Jesus Christ? Some of you know the bitterness of self-confidence and has let you down. You know well that you have failed the Lord. You know that you have failed yourself. You have not done what you want to do, and you have a lot to make up for. You devote yourself to the work of the kingdom and promoting faith in Jesus. You are zealous for Christ. You're intolerant and inflexible for anyone who would possibly compromise or take discipleship, not, or would not take discipleship seriously. You know what has to be done, and you devote yourself to doing it, yet deep down inside, you wonder if you're doing enough. Am I doing enough good things to atone for that thing that I have hid deep in my past that nobody knows about? Have I done enough to compensate for the thoughts I have and the motivations that I have? Can I compensate for past failures and when I have fallen short of my lofty goals? This is a subtle self-confidence that will just slowly destroy you. Let me pro here's the promise. You can only run on the hamster wheel of morality so long until you pass out from exhaustion and fall. Is your passion for Christ simply a joyless overcompensation for weakness and for failing, or is your faith built on the unfailing promises of Christ? And then there's others. I call this the Melissa Manchester syndrome. Some of you younger ones are like, who? Don't cry out loud. Keep it inside and learn how to hide your feelings. Fly high and proud, and if you should fall, remember you almost had it all. What is she telling you to do? Repress it deep and don't let people know that you're struggling. You failed Christ. You failed the other disciples. Your weaknesses and your failings are exposed. And you now struggle with self-criticism, spiritual depression, and self-loathing that eats away at you because your heart is filled with despair for what you have done or what you are. All your energy is spent at hiding your faults so nobody else will see it. And repressing your helplessness and your hopelessness so nobody can see it behind a veneer of a smile and I'm doing fine. Is your passion for Christ simply a cover-up for the emptiness and despair that you hold inside? Or is your faith built on the promises, the unfailing promises of God's grace? Let me tell you, your self-confidence will fail you every time. Whether it's a life of isolation, if it's political power, if it's overcompensating, if it's hiding the despair and the hopelessness you have, it will collapse like a tower of cards, like a sandcastle in the surf, like a rope made of sand. It will not save you. It will destroy you. And frankly, you know it will. It's just a matter of when. Don't ever say... It can't happen to me. It won't happen to me. Because it will. In our hearts, the seed of every type of sin is buried. And the right opportunity and the Lord withdrawing, withholding his hand will allow that sin to come forth. And you'll say, I didn't believe I could actually do what I have done. 
Unless you've tasted the bitterness of self-reliance, you will never know the sweetness of grace. Peter found out the hard way how unreliable his self-reliance was. But that, as Paul Harvey would say, is not the end of the story. It may be the end of our text this morning, but John picks that, this theme of glory restored. Turn to John chapter 21, just a few pages to the right on page 902. The end of the story, the postscript, if you will. John chapter 21 Verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, so Jesus has, um, at this point, Jesus has come and he has, repeat, he has gone to the cross, he has bore the weight of sin, he is resurrected, and now he comes to the Sea of Galilee where the disciples are floating in hopelessness and they're going back to the thing they knew, and that was fishing. And they see a figure on the shore. And that figure is cooking the morning breakfast as the sun comes up over the horizon. And after a long night of fishing, they had nothing. And Jesus says, unbeknownst to them, go on the other side. And they get this huge catch of fish. And the disciples are like, finally. Peter knew. He looked at that shore and there was Jesus. Probably the same distance that Jesus denied him, or he denied Jesus. He was now in the boat and he saw him, and it said he jumped in the water. Because the bitterness of self-confidence had been eating at him for days, and weeks maybe. And he sees Jesus again. He jumps in and he comes on the shore, and all the disciples eventually get to the shore and they begin to eat. In verse 15... When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these disciples? And he said to him, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. And Jesus asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, yes, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had um, known everything. You know, uh, because he said to him third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus walked the road of Calvary for Peter. He walked the road of Calvary for all who lay down their own lives and their own self-confidence and put their faith in his completed work. Jesus paid the redemption price. He discharged the debt. He made full atonement. He knows and calls his disciples by him on the road. Jesus knew that Peter would deny him. But Jesus also knew, no, by his grace, he would restore Peter. And the Peter who denied and the Peter who was restored were two different men. Peter had a better understanding of redemption He knew the bitterness of self-confidence and he knew the grace of Christ. Jesus laid down his life to restore Peter. Jesus went to the cross and laid down his life so Peter could lay down his life for Jesus. Jesus took the curse to bring him honor. Jesus died the death to give Peter life. Jesus is the one who called him from the shore. And as Jesus sat in the upper room, he knew the failures of Peter and the disciples. But Christ went to the cross anyway. Christ's love burned hot for Peter as Peter stood by the fire and denied him coldly. Christ laid down his life so Peter could find eternal life. J.C. Ryle says this, Like Peter, we must all come to a humble sense of our own innate weakness, a constant dependence on the strong for strength, a daily prayer to be held up because we cannot hold ourselves up. These are the secrets of safety of Christ. Ocean Park, do you love Christ? We can only follow Jesus when we lay down our self-confidence and trust in Christ's grace at the cross. Ocean Park, do you love Christ? 
We can only follow Christ when we devote ourselves to the proclamation of the gospel and not to the vain pursuits of political power and selfish ambition and self-love. Ocean Park, do you love Christ? Your failures, your mistakes, your sins are not the end of the story. They are the means to show you how much you need Jesus. When we follow the way of the cross and we crucify ourselves with Christ, we are raised to newness of life. We are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Trust in the one who knows your despair and your shame and your shortcomings and says, you will come after me because I laid down my life for you. Acts tells us that Peter was a changed man. And throughout the book of Acts, we see now his boldness against thousands of people who wanted to kill him and mocked him and beat him and derided them. They knew, Peter knew the bitterness of self-reliance and he knew the sweetness of grace and there was no going back. And he calls his brothers and sisters to do the same. At the end of his life, he was crucified. He did not recant. He did not deny Christ. He humbly laid down his life on, the cro on his cross, literally, because he trusted in the one who laid down his life on the cross of Calvary that he may be redeemed from the futility of self-reliance. Ocean Park, may we be like Peter and recognize the futility of our self-righteousness, our self-reliance, and may we repent. And may the cross of Christ empower us to lay down our life and follow him.